Once again, I am Catherine Zukatinsky. For those of you who don't know me, I'm an associate professor of radiology and medicine at McMaster University. And as the title of this slide suggests, I'm going to talk about gallium-68 and lutetium-177 dotatate and neuroendocrine tumors. So without further ado, let me proceed. I have nothing to disclose. And as the outline suggests, I thought I would start off with gallium-68 dotatate, a little bit of background, indications, imaging technique, tips and tricks and then move on to lutetium-177 dotatate therapy in terms of patient screening, maintenance of uh, somatostatin analog therapy requirements, treatment location, room preparation, drug administration, radiation safety and toxicity monitoring, and management of potential complications and follow-up. So let's start off with a little bit about defining the terms. Now, Eric's talk uh, was a lovely talk about uh, theragnostics, or theragnostics, and um, I thought I would be fairly brief on this then. So what do we mean when we talk about targeted radionuclide therapy, or TRT? That's one of uh, one uh, use of one or more radionuclides for targeted therapy at the cellular or molecular level typically leads to cell death by one, direct radiation, two, crossfire, and or three, the bystander effect. And one of the earliest examples of this is thyroid disease or thyroid cancer that can be treated with radioactive iodine and has been since the 1940s. In terms of radioimmunotherapy, often referred to as RIT, is the use of radio-labeled monoclonal antibodies for targeted therapy that lead to cell death by apoptosis from radiation and host immune response against target cells. You usually get apoptosis via signal transduction, complement mediated and antibody mediated cellular toxicity. And when we think of this, uh, we think of things such as Zevalin or Bexar, where Zevalin is a radio labeled anti CD20 monoclonal antibody that received FDA approval for treatment of relapsed or refractory low grade follicular or transformed B cell non Hodgkin lymphoma back in 2002. Bexar, uh, a radio-labeled anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody for the treatment of non-Hodgkin lymphoma shortly followed, and radionuclides that emit alpha or beta particles tend to be preferred for the treatment of bulky tumors. OJ electrons may be preferred for small. We will spend uh, some time uh, talking about uh, thyroid cancer management uh, utilizing PET-CT. Our learning objectives are as stated. We will focus on PET-CT in as far as FDG, uh, F18. We will skip over I-124, although it is a uh, available tracer. Uh, I do not believe much use currently. Uh, it, it doesn't enjoy much of it uh, in the United States or even abroad for, for, for this matter. Uh, differential thyroid cancer, uh, we will look at the PET-CT trends in the United States, uh, uh, epigenetic uh, modifications in the uh, DTC, uh, and then identifying source for thyroglobulin in those who have negative, particularly iodine scans, which is where we, uh, I think, employ this modality the most. Uh, we will briefly touch on anaplastic thyroid cancer, which is rare and uh, does have a certain role um, uh, uh, that we really need to be at least aware of. With that, uh, we will start with this rather complicated uh, graphical representation of utilization. And what that essentially uh, is showing, that utilization uh, and just to make a reference, uh, it's coming from the uh, Dr. Haymart's uh, University of Michigan uh, group, and uh, Dr. Webel uh, put out some very useful uh, studies demonstrating where we've been and where we're heading in utilization of different modalities, uh, not just PET-CT, uh, but this particular one 
includes PET CT as well as ultrasound. Uh, as you can see in green, it's a neck ultrasound. In uh, yellow, it's I-131 whole body scan. Uh, and PET is in blue. It is clear that uh, we have not had seen uh, much utilization uh, up until about 2004. Uh, why 2004? Well, it's because of reimbursement. Everything that we do or don't tied to uh, reimbursement for the efforts as well as the uh, validation within, uh, within the country that we practice. Uh, so after uh, 04, when uh, uh, Medicare uh, and Medicaid uh, started to reimburse, you do see Okay, the next uh, topic is on CNS radionuclide imaging. And we'll go over uh, the images, some clinical tips on the interpretation of these scans. So uh, those are going to show more or less uh, physiologic or metabolic uh, patterns on the image. And the rate pharmaceutical concentration can actually go pretty low, actually picomolar levels of uh, activity. So that's why one can image receptors uh, with a PET or SPET technique uh, as compared to MR. So these are the agents that uh, can be used for uh, brain imaging. Uh, this is kind of, in the old days, we used to use blood-brain barrier agents, uh, technetium protectinitate and DTPA. That's before CT was available. So we're just looking at uh, kind of like contrast, you know, leakage or enhancement on the scan. Uh, now we have uh, agents that will actually stick to the brain tissue. That's uh, HMPAO and uh, ECD, uh, very lipophilic agents. Uh, so you can get an image of perfusion pattern um, on, the, on the image. Uh, thallium is a tumor imaging agent. Uh, it goes through the sodium, uh, potassium sodium transporter. Uh, so tumors that have high sodium potassium transports will have high thallium uptake. There's a receptor imaging tracer that's been out for a few years now. This is I-123. Uh, flu pain goes to the uh, presynaptic uh, dopamine uh, reuptake receptor. Uh, FDGs for metabolism, and then there's uh, looking at amyloid uh, plaques with the uh, flubeta pair. So here's an example of a uh, dynamic flow scan uh, with ethylene cysteine dimer. Uh, it's an anterior view, uh, injecting it like a poor man's contrast. You see the carotid's anterior cerebral artery. And if there's any uh, uh, perfusion to the brain tissue, you're going to see this activity binding to the brain tissue. And you can do uh, uh, multiple views, uh, static images, to see the distribution in the brain. This was a study for evaluation of brain death. And if you see activity like this, that means there's still blood flow to the brain and you cannot call this patient brain dead. So when we use this perfusion tracer, it's for brain death. You can also use it for assessment uh, outcome after stroke. Uh, some people use this tracer for kind of like a, like a cardiac stress test of the brain. You have them uh, with acetylzolamide or breathing some CO2 to try to increase the blood flow to the brain and then see if there's a change in the distribution pattern. You can also use these tracers for looking at dementia. However, most people now are just using FDG PET and then uh, looking for uh, seizures. Now, when you're using a perfusion tracer to try to detect seizures, it has to be injected during the ictal phase, within the first minute, and most places can't get that tracer in the patient.